Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I wanted to talk about geodetic coordinates and how we can use them to compute longitude and latitude. So to start off, let me let's do a quick recap of what is longitude, uh, latitude, and altitude. And let's start with longitude. That's probably the easiest one to uh, chat about. I'm sure people are familiar with this. So why don't I just go ahead and flash up a screenshot of a graphic I made showing a top-down view of Earth looking uh, from space, kind of looking at the North Pole. And longitude is really pretty darn simple. We basically set a zero line, which is the prime meridian, which is this green line. And then all we do uh, is measure the, the angular displacement to go from that prime, prime meridian to a point going from the center of Earth to the point, which is that blue line. And all we're looking at is the angular difference between the blue line and the green line. And a positive longitude, which is that positive lambda I'm showing the graphic here, is positive if you move eastward from the prime meridian, okay? So longitude, let's just go ahead and say we're going to denote using the angle uh, lambda. Maybe a couple of things to call out. Lambda is typically what's used for most symbols for longitude. Now, the textbook, uh, the Stevenson Lewis textbook that I think we've been following a bit, uses different notations depending on what type of longitude you're, lo you're talking about. So what I want to talk about today is maybe we should start adding some adjectives in front of these to quantify exactly what we're talking about. So we are looking at terrestrial longitude. So that means that's the longitude measured uh, from the prime meridian, which is sort of a terrestrial static fixture. This is different than celestial longitude, right? Where you might want to be looking at angular displacements from some other uh, line, which might be pointing towards some distant star, which is maybe not rotating with Earth. So anyway, that's probably the easiest thing to, to talk about here is longitude. We're actually talking about terrestrial longitude, and we're going to denote this as lambda. Uh, again, in the Stevenson Lewis textbook, they may use lambda for celestial longitude, but I want to use lambda here to denote terrestrial longitude, okay? Okay, longitude is pretty easy because it is because if you look at the Earth from the uh, from space looking down to the North Pole or from the South Pole, it's it's a perfect sphere. Okay, now latitude is where it gets a little bit more interesting because from uh, uh, as we know, our Earth is not actually a perfect spheroid right? uh, sphere. It's a spheroid, right? It's basically an ellipse which is revolved around the axis of rotation. So to draw this in a ex grossly exaggerated fashion. Um, um, let's draw it like such. So, right, there's a semi-major axis and a semi-minor axis. So here's the North Pole, and here's the South Pole. Okay, and I, I don't know, we could draw, here's the United States, something like this. Oh gosh, I, I'm a horrible artist. What, what does the U.S. look like? It's some, something like that, right? And then you got this connected to Mexico and South America which I don't know what that looks like. Then you got Russia, Europe, Africa, you know, Australia. So you, you get what I'm saying, right? This is what it looks like from the side. So the Earth, it's shorter from North Pole to South Pole than it is from going across the equator, right? So the semi-major axis of Earth is, is larger than obviously the semi-minor axis. So this is, this is a, again, grossly exaggerated picture of the Earth. But I just wanted to show that if you take a cross section across any meridian plane, so maybe we should say that this is a drawing in the meridian plane or a section in a meridian plane, meridian plane, right? It's not necessarily through the prime meridian plane. It's just some meridian plane slice that we take of the Earth. So again, maybe what we should do is let me get, let me show my little prop I've got here. So I made a little I made a little globe prop uh, where I stole basically my one of my kids' uh, playground balls. But you know, here's North America, South America. You got the Atlantic Ocean, and then you got Earth, uh, Russia, and Europe, and all that kind of good stuff. And then Australia's hanging out here in the South Pole. So basically, Earth it's not a sphere like this. It's a squashed sphere like this, right? If we were to squash it, it looks more like a spheroid, right? Okay, so all we're doing is I'm taking some arbitrary plane, some cut through this, and I want to draw that, okay? So what makes this interesting is most people would say, okay, you've got some, you got some point where maybe your, your aircraft is hanging out or something like that, okay? Now, what is the latitude here? Uh, let me see if I can draw this, sorry, this exact section uh, <laughs> that I want to investigate, I didn't draw this in a very clean fashion. Let's draw it. 
Maybe something like that, okay? Okay, so latitude can be defined in multiple ways. And most people will probably tell you latitude is something to do with the angular displacement from the equatorial plane, and it's measured positive going north and negative going south, right? Which all makes perfectly good sense. The only thing that's interesting about this is you have a couple of options of how you want to define latitude. So one way you could do this is you could take a point from the center of Earth, right, from the center, uh, the exact center, draw a line here to the point, okay? And then this is your latitude here. This is one option for latitude, okay? Interestingly, this is what's referred to as geocentric latitude, okay? The other way you could do this is instead you could take a look at the spheroid, right? The surface of Earth here. You could draw a normal, a, a, a vector which is normal to this. Right, so this here is a right angle, okay? So this blue line is normal to the surface of Earth and it goes through the point P, okay? You could also call this the angle now. You can see between the equatorial plane and this blue line, this could also be referred to as a latitude. This is what's referred to as geodetic latitude, okay? And typically, if, uh, if it's not specified, most people are talking about geodetic latitude. This is sort of the one we want, and this is what's mostly used, okay? So the, the terminology for this, you may see this as a phi or, uh, or phi, okay? So again, this phi, this is not an Euler bank angle, right? This is a phi, this is geodetic latitude, okay? And coming back here, geocentric latitude, you may see this as like phi prime or something like that. Okay, so long story short, what we're interested in is geodetic latitude. So again, we better add an adjective in front of latitude here that we're really talking about geodetic latitude, right? And while we're staring at this picture, actually, this brings up another uh, point where we should ask, what are we talking about altitude, right? What is altitude? Is altitude the distance from the point uh, to the surface of Earth along the green line or along the blue line? And to just answer it, most of the time we are going to be talking about this distance. We're talking about the, the distance from the point P to the surface of the spheroid along the geodetic latitude line. So H is actually this distance here. So this is altitude, or maybe we can further quantify this as geodetic altitude. All right. So again, maybe we should tack on another adjective. When we're really talking about altitude, let's call this thing geodetic altitude. And that's again, typically denoted as H, okay? Um, okay, and then, oh, here, the latitude, maybe we should write this down. Let's denote this for our purposes. Like we said, most texts, will, you'll see it either as phi or phi. Let's call this thing phi. For the, for the remainder of our discussion, okay? So what we really see here is that you can specify the location of some object above the spheroid, uh, above Earth effectively, by this triple of uh, latitude, longitude, altitude, right? So a lot of times, the geodetic position, position, can be specified by three numbers, right? Uh, the latitude, the geodetic latitude, the uh, terrestrial longitude, and the geodetic altitude here. So this is, again, these va values, and sometimes you'll see this you know, as an LLA or a lat long altitude. This is what we're talking about, okay? So now that we have these things defined, um, give me a second to erase the board, and let's start talking about some other parameters we're gonna need in order to start calculating and relating how do geodetic geodetic coordinates relate to things like velocity north, velocity east, and things like that. All right, so before we go further, I want to take a look at this document uh, by Krakowski and Thompson. It's entitled Geodetic Position Computations, uh, and it's from 1974, and I'll leave a link to uh, a copy of it in the description of this video. But let's read this excerpt from this where they define a couple of these parameters we're going to need to start defining. So in particular, let's, let's just go ahead and read through this so we can uh, understand it. So it says, um, section 1.2, it says, right, on the surface of an ellipsoid, an infinite infinite number of planes can be drawn through a point on the surface which contains the normal to this point. These planes are known as normal planes, and the curves of intersection of the normal planes and the surface of the ellipsoid are called normal sections. 
At each point, there are two mutually perpendicular normal sections whose curvatures are maximum and minimum, which are called the principal normal sections. These principal sections are the meridian and the prime vertical normal sections, and their radii of curvature are denoted M and N, respectively. See figure two and figure three. So, uh, tell you what, let's go ahead. I wanna, I wanna parse that down. I wanna make sure we understand the geometry of what's going on, okay? So, to help with this, I've got a Again, let's pull up our little prop here. And uh, again, this here is Earth. Again, imagine this. This thing is some spheroid. It's not a perfect ball. And let's go ahead and pick some point and some normal. So the first thing that we need to look at here is let me make sure I've got, I, I want to make sure I've got quote everything properly. Um, okay, so we need to go ahead and look at a surface normal to this ball. So let's pick some point, uh, I don't know, how about how about right over here in, over Canada? Some point in the middle of Canada, normal to the surface. So here's, here's Canada. So I'm gonna use this pen to denote sort of a normal point. And maybe the eraser of the pen is the point P that I'm interested in. So there's a surface normal that is normal to this, this ellipsoid going through this point P. Uh, or sorry, yeah, which goes through the point P, okay? So the first thing that they say is that, right, there's, you can see that there's an infinite number of planes that can be drawn which, which contain this surface normal, right? So for example, let me see if I can do this. Um, you can see here, again, here's a surface normal. Here's, here's like a plane, like a sheet of paper, right? right? So you can basically, here's, here's one plane that goes through it, right? Here's another plane. Here's another plane, another plane. That, again, there's infinite number of planes, right, that can go through uh, and contain this surface normal. So I'll tell you what, let's grab ourselves a Sharpie and just start drawing ourselves uh, the, these planes. Well, actually, not the plane. I, I guess I can't draw the plane. What we can draw, though, is we can draw how does this plane, you know, an arbitrary plane, how does it intersect with the surface, right? And that's what they called... Um, section normals, right? So again, there's an infinite number of section normals. And so you can basically see that these section normals are basically going to be, you know, here's one section normal. Here's, sorry, I'm trying to draw this, right? Here's another section normal. There's going to be infinite number of section normals you can draw going over this, this, uh, through this point, right? So again, here's our, here's our surface normal, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is certain ones of these planes, each one of these planes, because this thing is an ellipsoid, right? It's squashed. The radius of curvature of each one of these surface normals, they're all different. So one of these is going to have a section normal with curvature, which is maximum, right? So this is going to be the, uh, the meridian uh, normal section, right? So one of these things... Uh, let's, let's maybe say it's this one right here, okay? So this is going to be the meridian surface normal with radius of curvature M, okay? And then one of the other ones they said is it's perpendicular to this, so it's basically it's the one that's going to be going in the opposite direction. And this thing has a radius of curvature who, which is uh, minimum, right? So in this case, this is going to be N, Right? Maybe, maybe did I did I say that correctly? I just want to double check. Right? So the maximum one is this guy, and that is going to be yeah. Its radius of curvature is m. This is the meridian normal section, and then the other one is the prime vertical norm. Uh, wait a second. Did I? No, I think that's right. Yeah with radius of curvature n, okay? So that's a picture that goes along with this. So let's go up and hop back to the board and write down formulas for what are m and n. All right, so let's start with the meridian radius of curvature. Here's figure two from the Krakowski and Thompson 1974 text, which shows where this radius of curvature is located. And it turns out this radius of curvature, it's actually in the meridian plane. So it's actually the radius of curvature of the generating ellipse uh, at the point of interest. So going back to our, our ball example, right, our globe. So this literally is this vertical line here in the sort of north-south direction, right? It's the radius of curvature of this curve again in the north-south direction so uh, they go ahead and derive what is that that radius of curvature M okay and what they end up with here is that this is the semi major axis times the quantity 1 minus the eccentricity squared all over 1 minus e squared sine of the latitude 
right? This is our geodetic latitude squared to the three halves, okay? So here we go. So here's a formula for that radius of curvature, right? So this again is the meridian radius of curvature, okay? So now let's turn our attention to the prime vertical. Ver uh, I can't spell it backwards. Vertical radius of curvature, right? And because we said uh, what we saw in the uh, document that it's basically perpendicular to this, again, let me figure, I'll flash up figure three. So this again is from the Krakowski and Thompson document. This is figure three showing where that, that radius of curvature is. And again, we see that since it's perpendicular coming back to our globe, we said the, uh, the meridian radius of curvature was north-south. So actually the prime vertical radius of curvature is the radius of curvature in the east-west direction, right? Which is perpendicular. So I did draw this uh, kind of quasi-accurately in this horrible globe uh, prop diagram. So again, all we end up with is that radius of curvature n is given by a all over 1 minus e squared times sine of geodetic latitude squared to the one half, okay? So again, in both of these, what we've got now is the A is your uh, semi-major axis of the ellipse, right? And E is your eccentricity. Okay, so, or sometimes referred to as your first eccentricity. Okay? So the question should probably be, what are the semi-major axes and the eccentricity for Earth, okay? So depending on what model of Earth you're using, you're gonna get different numbers. I'm gonna uh, propose that we use what seems to be a very popular and increasingly uh, widely adopted model, namely the WGS84 model, okay? If you look at the WGS84 model, uh, what we end up with here is they use a number of, semi-major axis is six, three, seven, eight, one, three, seven point zero meters. Okay, so I guess it's what, six million, three hundred, seventy eight thousand, hundred thirty seven meters. And this first eccentricity is zero point zero eight one eight one nine one nine zero eight four two six two two. There we go. Great. Okay, <laughs> so with those in mind, you know what might be helpful at this point? You may want to think about building yourself uh, either a function in, in, in your software package of choice or maybe like a simulink block where if you tell me what the latitude is and the model of your world, it'll just go ahead and calculate what are these two radiuses of radii of curvature, right? So that's that's pretty trivial. So I would suggest at this point, maybe you go ahead and you make yourself a block where you give it the geodetic latitude phi, right? And this thing will spit out M and N. And it basically just implements these equations here. Sure, maybe you also have to tell it A and B or A and E. Maybe you plug those in as, you know, whatever numbers you want. But I would recommend using your WGS84 model, right? Okay. So if we have this information, uh, these radius of curvatures, what's nice about this is we can actually now go ahead and write the um, position of the vehicle in the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame. So we could write now that the position of this point or the vehicle or however you like to think about this in the Earth-centered Earth fixed frame is going to be let me see. It's basically just using a spherical to Cartesian uh, mapping transformation. So this is now going to be n plus your geodetic altitude times cosine of your geodetic latitude times cosine of your terrestrial longitude. And then it is n plus h cosine of phi sine of lambda. And then n times 1 minus e squared time, or sorry, plus H, this quantity uh, times sine of phi. Great. Okay. So that, great, this is again, this is our, our uh, spherical, right? The spherical coordinates were, were uh, lo uh, 
longitude, latitude, altitude, and now we change it to literally X, Y, Z in the ECEF frame, okay? All right, so now what we want to do is we want to ask, is there a way that we can now relate, how about things like velocity north, velocity east, and velocity down? How are those related to things like the time rate of change of the longitude, the time rate of change of the latitude, and the time rate of change of the altitude, right? What's this relationship, okay? And I think we've now got the machinery in place to, to, to deal with that, right? So the most immediately useful uh, relationship, or the easiest one to look at is, let's look at the velocity north relationship. So I think you'll agree that if you think about this long enough, the velocity north, it's basically, since we can use the fact that we've got the meridian radius of curvature and we can basically say that uh, we've got the time rate of change of the geodetic latitude right this is sort of the the angular rate we just need to multiply that by a distance to get a velocity right so basically the distance here would be the meridian radius of curvature plus the geodetic altitude right because I mean if you draw the picture right you've got this thing here and like this, and this is the geodetic um, latitude phi, right? So this distance here, we said the radius of curvature of this was m. Well, I guess it's 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 kind of hard to <laughs> to draw this. That doesn't necessarily come to here, but this distance here is h, right? And m is sort of the moment or, or this additional arm or this distance, right? So this vector is sweeping through. If this is changing at phi dot, right? This is going to give you a velocity, which is velocity in the northerly direction, right? So that's where we get this from. So this is pretty helpful, okay? Uh, a more helpful form of this is actually, let's solve this thing for phi dot. So let's say that now we have phi dot is equal to velocity north all over the meridian radius of curvature plus the geodetic altitude. Okay, so let's box this up. That's very helpful. We can now do a very similar thing in the easterly direction. It's a little bit more complex, but we are then going to use, instead of the meridian radius of curvature, we're going to use the prime vertical radius of curvature, and we're going to end up with the... Uh, uh, yeah, th this relationship. I guess if you boil it down to this, you end up with, you can get this, that the time rate of change of the terrestrial longitude is the velocity in the easterly direction all over n plus h times cosine of phi. Okay, great. So let's box that up. Okay. And then the last thing we need to relate is, uh, how about velocity down in h dot? Well, uh, that's pretty simple. Those are just negatives of each other, right? So h dot is just negative velocity down, okay? So look at that. If you box this up, we basically have three relationships now that tell us uh, how the longitude and the latitude, their time rate of change, are related to velocity east, velocity down, and I guess, or sorry, velocity north, east, and down, okay? So what's awesome about this, if you think about this, we can basically go ahead and create a, a simulating block or a block diagram where coming in on one side is we want things like the velocity north. Let's say you know the velocity north, the velocity east, and the velocity down, right? So you know the local velocity of the vehicle or the object, okay? Now what I want to do is I want to generate a block or a system, right, which is going to now tell me the time rate of change of the longitude, uh, or maybe let's do the latitude first. How about the latitude, the longitude dot, and h dot? Right? And we see it's a really simple relationship. It's basically implementing these equations. The only thing to think about is we need the n and the m. Luckily, we just talked about how to get those two radius, radii of curvature, right? So let's sketch this thing out. So what this is going to look like, actually, uh, sorry, I forgot. We, we're going to need one more. <laughs> actually, these should be, let, let's not put the dots on these. Let's have this spit out the actual not the rates, but the actual latitude, longitude, altitude, okay? So let's go ahead and start formulating that. Okay, so let's say that we can get latitude dot, longitude dot, and 
h dot internally. All we have to do is integrate each one of these, right? You integrate these, 1 over s, 1 over s, 1 over s, right? And coming out of these are going to be latitude, longitude, altitude, okay? Great, so now we can basically hook this up to the outputs of this block, okay? like that. Now all we got to do is figure out how do I get phi dot. Well phi dot is right here. It's velocity north over this. So I basically need a sub block here which is going to basically compute Vn all over m plus h. Okay. So apparently what you need to tell this block is you need three things. You need V north, I need the radius of curvature m, and I need the geodetic altitude h. Well we can start basically trying to cobble all these signals together. Well here's V north, so here's V north right away. Here's h over here so I can basically feed this back. Oh boy, sorry, this is going to get a little bit ugly. Okay, like such. Now, where does this radius of curvature come in? Remember the block we made earlier, right? Where if you gave this block phi, the latitude, this thing would be able to compute m and n, right? And all this was doing was implementing the WGS84 model of plugging in the those static equations for uh, how m and n are related to things like a, uh, E and then phi, right? It's just basically plugging those in. So here's our phi signal. So again, let's just do this. I, I apologize for the spaghetti, but I think everyone gets the idea. Now you know M and N. So now I can go ahead and basically feed M up to here. And if you're okay with all of this ridiculously ugly signal flow, we're halfway there. We would do a similar operation for lambda dot, right? So lambda dot here is implementing this equation, right? So it's V east all over N plus H times cosine of phi. So again, we need to tell this thing V east. We need to give it the prime vertical radius of curvature. We need to give it altitude and we also need to give it the latitude. And again, all those signals are now available. I don't want to draw it because I, I think it's going to just create too much ugliness, but I think everyone sees how to hook that up. The last one here is H dot. And again, that's super duper easy because we said H dot was just negative V dot down. So I just need to come in here, hit this thing with a minus one, and there you go. Perfect. So uh, I think we're in business. Tell you what, let's jump over to MATLAB Simulink and I'll just show you maybe a cleaner version of this, how I, I implement it and talk about a couple other uh, bells and whistles. All right, so here are a couple of Simulink blocks that I've built to support this calculation. So let's take a uh, look first at this WGS84 block. This is pretty darn simple. If I look underneath of it, it basically is, again, just calculating the uh, meridian uh, radius of curvature and the prime vertical radius of curvature. And again, it's just implementing those static equations. I actually used a um, function block to do this. So you can kind of see this is one way you could do this and make this a little bit easier on yourself. So instead of having to spaghetti wires together and connect sums and products and divides and all that stuff, you can do it all in line in one block using something like this. Similarly, the prime vertical radius, it's just, just the exact same calculation that we showed on the board. So not that bad. It's pretty simple. Once we have that in place, we can then use it like we saw to basically create a block which computes the geodetic position if you tell me the velocity north, east, and I change the interface a little bit, and I'll show you why in a second, but again, we remember that velocity down is just the negative of h dot, so as long as you're reconciling the negative one and making sure you you know if you're talking about position down dot or h dot, everything should be fine. So let's go ahead and look underneath this. So again, this is nothing fancy. All I'm doing is I'm leveraging the WGS84 block like we talked about. You feed it phi and it will give you those two radiuses, uh, radii of curvature. And then I'm using that same trick that we saw earlier of using a function block to go ahead and calculate the geodetic latitude and the terrestrial longitude. And then I just go ahead and integrate them together. And that's pretty much it. The only other kind of interesting thing is I put some bounds on uh, lambda. If you notice this integration, it can go ahead and start integrating uh, and going up and up and up and up and up. And usually you want to limit your latitude and your longitude. For example, you want your longitude uh, most of the time for most systems, right? You want it between positive 180 degrees and negative 180 degrees or positive uh, pi and negative pi. So I do that here and I just bound the longitude so uh, that doesn't 
cause any issues. I could have put it at the same thing, uh, a latitude bound, where you, most times you want the latitude to be bound between positive and negative 90 degrees. But, you know, I'll leave that for something for you. If you'd like to add additional functionality uh, to your system, you can add that here as well. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much it. It. Let's talk about where you can now use this block. So I've actually impl implemented and inserted that into our RCAM model that we were playing with earlier. So you see, um, earlier in our previous video, we talked about the navigation equations where I would be able to take the states of the vehicle and now be use it to compute the velocity north, the velocity east, and in this case, the negative of velocity down or h dot, right? So that was the previous video discussing navigation equations. Once we have that, I can then feed those outputs into my geodetic position block input and use this to calculate the geodetic um, latitude, the terrestrial longitude and the altitude so this is a lot of fun and this actually opens the door for a lot of other analysis in fact we'll take this and use it in situations like current trying to build flight visualization packages in the future where we need to pass in information about the latitude and the longitude so that the flight visualization package knows where to draw the aircraft over the earth but again that's a topic for another day so with that being said, I think this is a great spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. If you scroll a little ways down and click on that subscribe button, it really does surprisingly help me continue with these videos. Um, and also, please leave a comment in the section below. I would love to hear from you and understand um, what's working, what's not, if you like this or not, or if there are other topics you'd like me to cover in the future. So with that being said, uh, I hope to catch you at one of these future videos, and until then, I think I'll sign off for now. Talk to you later. Bye.